So I want to speak to this theme of um, how Dharma teachings, how Dharma practice uh, can support us in meeting the climate emergency, uh, but also equally other things that are very, very challenging for us. And I want to put that out there. The climate emergency is probably one of the most acute crises that we're facing, but it's far from being the only one whether as societies or in our personal lives. It's important to, to put that out there. And particularly, how can the, the teachings, the practice, how can they support us to meet um, these challenges in ways that sustain us and not only sustain us, but actually energize us? I think that's a key. We can see it also in the intentions this morning, you know, something that we're uh, contemplating as well as allowing skillful action uh, to come through. Yeah. Skillful action to come through. And I think as people who are kind of share the interests that have brought us here, here we're interested in that, yeah, not just in acting, but also in acting in ways that are skillful. Yeah. Uh, support change um, and not its opposite. Yeah. Skillful ways of acting. And I was, when I was reflecting on this, um, on today, I, I kind of thought, oh, I haven't spoken about this for a really long time. So about what I'm going to speak about. <laughs> so I'm going to use a model um, that I came up with a long time ago. And I'll kind of tell you one of my trade secrets in a moment. So I have this, um, I have this real passion for um, Dharma practice also as an active form in the world. And one of the things I've been exploring in, in the years that I've been teaching is how to offer the teachings in a way that um, empowers people to act yeah empowers people to act and this model i came up with uh, quite a really long time ago it might be close to 15 years i'm not sure um but particularly in the country of my birth israel where i also teach a lot i've had this ongoing issue of how to bring dharma practitioners uh to to work with the occupation of Palestine and the human rights issues that are going on there. And so, um, so this, this model I'm going to speak about came through that. Yeah. It's a model for a one week, it was a talk on a one week meditation retreat, <laughs> um, silent retreat. Yeah. And it was like, uh, how do how do we weave this in? How do we bring this in? And as often happens in, in kind of coming up with the model, it was also very useful for me to frame my own practice and understand my own practice up to that time and also since then. So the model has three parts. It's a three-part model, and I, I called it at the time, you know, practicing Dharma in challenging times. Yeah, so it's kind of yeah re relevant to to any challenge that we find ourselves um and i i kind of want to begin this reflection before going into the three parts of the model to actually just take a moment and, and reflect and feel like what um you know practicing dharma in, in challenging times how can dharma teachings support us yeah what are we talking about? Or what am I talking about when I'm referring to Dharma teachings? What aspect of this incredible, profound, deep and wide teachings am I referring to? So, of course, wisdom and compassion, just like with the theme of today. But again, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, we can keep unpacking these ideas. We can keep unpacking these concepts um, to understand more fully. Yeah. So what, what are the wisdom and compassion teachings? That we uh, that I'm referring to. Um, so one of them is uh, what I spoke of this morning and what we've been practicing through the day, 
seeing the interconnected nature, the dependently arising nature of our experience, yeah, and of our existence, actually. Yeah. It's interdependent. And don't know how the elements meditation was for you this morning. I often like to ask people afterwards, but I prioritize the silence at that time. I love that meditation because I feel like it just connects us to the, this really immediate sense of, oh, <laughs> it feels like there's this thing here that's kind of got boundaries. Yeah, this body, heart, and mind, yeah, has got boundaries. But actually, when we start reflecting, yeah, just on the body, we see, actually, where are those boundaries? <laughs> what is it that I can call me? Where does it, where does it stop? How to define it? Yeah. And there's a really beautiful quote from um, the Dharma teacher and activist, Joanna Macy, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with her. You know, she says when, when she was asked one time what, how she sees herself, and she said, I see myself as a flow through. <laughs> so we can see how we can take that elements meditation of the elements, but we can bring that into anything, you know, a flow through of genetics, a flow through of family uh, conditioning, a flow through of biology, you know, a flow through of nature. Yeah, things coming through, flowing through. Yeah of that boundary so that seeing that dependent nature seeing that interconnected nature which we need to see again and again and again because it's not our habit yeah it's not the the the, the intuitive human condition to see that yeah we tend to see the the separation and the boundaries so seeing that's one of the things i'm reflecting uh, i'm i'm um relating to when I speak about Dharma teachings. Um, another is, um, again, I mentioned it this morning, the fact that our experience is shaped yeah, also through the way of relating. Yeah. And again, in the Buddha's words, the mind is the forerunner of all things. Yeah. The heart mind is the forerunner of all things. What, what does it mean? It comes before anything else. Yeah. What we experience is shaped by the heart-mind yeah, attitude and way of relating. Yeah, the forerunner of all things is such a beautiful um, phrase. Yeah. So that's another kind of thread that we kind of can rely on, explore uh, and understand. The understanding yeah, and the exploration that change is possible. Yeah, what we call the possibility of possibilities. Yeah, change is possible. Yeah, things are changing all the time. Yeah, and so bringing change intentionally is possible. Yeah, not just taking change as something that happens, but also shaping that change. Right, because if mind is the foreigner of all things, we can impact how things change. Yeah, both in our own hearts and minds and in the world. And the last uh, thread of Dharma teachings, which I'll speak of more, it's one of the uh, three parts of the model, is that um, we can contribute to change yeah, in the world. Yeah, we can contribute to change in the world through the cultivation of the wholesome and the abandoning of the unwholesome. Again, I said it this morning. Yeah. The letting go, the not feeding, that which brings harm and suffering, affliction in the Buddha's words, yeah. and the nourishment, the cultivation, the development of that which is wholesome and skillful. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. So finally, after all that introduction, here's the model. It's going to bound to be disappointing now after all that build up. <laughs> I'm going to pause again. So yeah. So when we reflect um, on how Dharma can support us, yeah, meeting challenges, time the first part of the model is Dharma practice and teachings as a refuge. Yeah. 
dharma practice and teachings as a refuge. Yeah. And one of the aspects of the teachings that we teach less in the West, yeah, this place of refuge. And yet, again, so key to our practice. It's part of why we come on retreat, right? The capacity to disconnect. Yeah. The capacity to kind of retreat from the world yeah, for a little while. Yeah. Whether it's our, our daily practice, whether it's when we come together on a day like this. So a place of rest, yeah, and rest brings with it rejuvenation, yeah, so rest for rejuvenation, a place of rest, a place of safety, yeah, a place of rejuvenation and resourcing. And I don't know about you, but um, I know for myself with my daily meditation practice, I can really tell the difference <laughs> days when I don't manage to do it. Yeah. So we see, we start to see the power of it, right? So that rest, that rejuvenation, that resourcing, yeah. when that isn't there, yeah, then the world looks different. The reactivity goes up, yeah. the way we are in the world. And it's one of my favorite things to quote recently. I recently learned that the Dalai Lama practices for four hours a day. Come on, this is really a bombshell, unless you know it already. The Dalai Lama meditates for four hours a day. You know, what does that mean? You know, yeah, why does he do it? Yeah. So we can have, I haven't asked him. So this is my answer, not his. But I imagine because it has an impact. Yeah. Imagine because it has an impact. So a place of rest, rejuvenation, resourcing. Yeah. Also a place of inspiration. Yeah. So Dharma is refuge. Our practice is a refuge. Also inspires us. We see, oh, you know, I cannot follow my habits. <laughs> Even if it's just for a moment. Yeah. It's possible to open to this. Yeah. I mentioned, you know, having COVID recently. And it was so fascinating to see the power of the practice in, in that. You know, so having a lot of discomfort in the body and being able to tune in because of practice, tune into pleasantness at the same time. Yeah. And you know, I love these kind of things. I'm a little bit bonkers. And I love these kind of things and having this headache, a really strong headache. And at the same time, just this meditative pleasure at the same time. Whoa, this is amazing. You know, it's amazing. So a place of inspiration, yeah? it's a place of inspiration for us, what's possible. Dharma is refuge also, um, you know, as that inspiration, you know, seeing the radicality of what is possible for a human being also in others, right? We go to refuge to the Dharma. We also go for refuge to um, the Buddha. Yeah, Buddha symbolizes the possibility of an awakened mind. Yeah. So the radicality of the Buddha's awakening, yeah. and not just him, of course. Yeah. Radicality of others walking the path. I mentioned the Dalai Lama. Yeah. There's many others. Some of my favorites, Gandhi, yeah, Martin Luther King, yeah. Vandana Shiva, if anyone's heard of her. <laughs> yes, great, yes. <laughs> always pleased when people have heard of her yeah. so you know this kind of like oh wow you know this is also a refuge that we take as we practice we know by seeing these inspirational people where we're heading yeah yeah what's possible and we can really take shelter in that and there's this beautiful phrase um also comes from the dalai lama he says you know when things are really difficult yeah Put your head in the lap of the Buddha, yeah, and shelter there. Yeah? Such a beautiful phrase, you know, because we're being kept safe, yeah, but we're also at the same time, what is, what is it that's, what's the refuge? The refuge is the possibility, yeah, of what's possible for, for human beings in the world. So Dharma as refuge, yeah, and again, those kind of, 
those teachings that I mentioned earlier, you know, also refuges, you know, the sense of light. Oh, it's like I'm hitting my head against the wall here, <laughs> you know. Things are getting worse, not better. You know, we all know that if we're caring people. And then the sense of, oh, what's possible? What's possible? Change is possible. Yeah. And it happens all the time. Yeah. So Dharma is refuge also as a framework yeah, that invites us for exploration, invites us um, to deepen in understanding, invites us to explore, yeah, to investigate our experience, to find guidance, to find possibilities. And one of the people who've been really inspirational for me uh, with this one, so I'm going to give an example of Dharma's refuge, um, is a rabbi called Arik Asherman. He's uh, obviously rabbi Jewish. Um, and when I met him, he'd been working for many years for an organization called Rabbis for Human Rights. Um, and then they became a little bit too mainstream for him. So he <laughs> branched out on his own. Anyway, very, very dedicated uh, human rights activist in the, um, in the Palestinian occupied territories. And I remember many years ago reading an article um, by him, which was called, Why I Didn't Listen to My Lawyer. <laughs> why I didn't listen to my lawyer. So he was, uh, he was on trial for uh, assisting some protests. Um, so actually within Israel, but also of a, of a Palestinian community. And the, the state was offering him a plea bargain, yeah, saying, you know, if you, uh, you know, admit that you did wrong, and if you, uh, sign a piece of paper say for the next five years you will not protest with these people then you will uh we will not press charges yeah. but if uh if you don't then we will press charges and the i think he was facing a one-year prison sentence um for that and of course his solicitor his lawyer was advising him to take the plea because <laughs> that's their job and his article, you know, uh, published in one of the uh, main newspapers in Israel, uh, was, you know, why I didn't listen to my lawyer. And that's because he takes refuge in something bigger, yeah, than that. Yeah, so it was really, you know, not using the language of refuge, using the appropriate language in the Jewish tradition of integrity, yeah, of ethics, yeah, of knowing what is right yeah. and saying I'm willing to go forth and risk this yeah because there's something bigger at stake than me yeah so here we see this this truth yeah which is beyond you know I say dharma and hopefully we're getting the sense it's not just Buddha dharma it's the the wisdom traditions of the world which are all actually pointing to this and saying, oh, you know. And sometimes, you know, we hear these kind of stories and, and I'm really aware when I tell them, I always tell them and they're like, ah. Oh. And we feel like really inspired, but also like, I could never do that. We might feel small at the same time and just opening to say, that is possible. Yeah. And that's what if we wish we can work towards, doesn't mean we have to take that on as our goal, doesn't mean that we have to already be there. Yeah. But it's possible to have that kind of courage and integrity. Yeah. And so I kind of, yeah, he didn't end up in prison. He, he did not end up in prison, by the way. Yeah. But there was that real risk. Yeah, so having that sense of that integrity. So this is the first kind of uh, 
the first part of that three part model Dharma as refuge and kind of already brings us to the kind of leads us to the second. Yeah. But that sense of the refuge and the refuge is the whole spectrum from a place of safety, rest, rejuvenation, which we need to know how to take. Yeah. Yeah. We need to know how to take, but that as always, that's part of a process. Yeah. It's not, the end is not the only thing in itself. And so it can also, the the refuge of inspiration, the refuge of remembering the possibilities that are in each of us, what's possible. Refuge of the framework of wisdom teachings of all traditions that remind us of what's important, what's meaningful, what's possible. And that we each uncover that in our own way and at our own pace. So the second part of the, of the model is Dharma as cultivation. Dharma as cultivation, as development. And the word cultivation, um, the Pali word bhavana, which is translated as meditation usually, actually literally means cultivation. It's quite interesting. Yeah, because meditation we tend to see as a, as a thing. Yeah, cultivation is obviously a process. Yeah, it's a process. So dharma as dharma practice as a cultivation, and this is also um, if we think about the model of the four noble truths. You know, uh, the Buddha's the Buddha's teachings in a nutshell. This is the fourth truth. Yeah, there is a path. Yeah, a path that we um, walk, a path that we embody, a path of practice. Yeah, so it's something that we, it's a process that we engage in and a process of cultivation. And if you haven't asked yet, I will ask cultivation of what? (laughs) Really important to ask these questions because we can cultivate all kinds of things, right? It's It's a, the word cultivation is a, agricultural world where you know it means to grow things so you know we could grow uh we could grow a monocrop <laughs> with lots of um you know pesticides and herbicides and it can be quite a harmful thing and it can be a beautiful yeah thing a nourishing thing a lovely thing in the world yeah so cultivation of what cultivation of skills skillful wholesome liberating ways of relating and attitudes and intentions in the world just like we're doing today this is kind of it's not by accident that this is in the middle (laughs) of the three this is the heart of our practice always cultivation so the cultivation of clear seeing yeah Cultivation of interest, you know, cultivation of investigation, looking at our experience, remembering, saying, ah, yeah, how is this dependently arising? How am I dependently arising? Where's the interconnection right now when I'm really angry with somebody else, you know, and I'm about to shout at them? How, what, what, where is that? <laughs> how do I bring that in? Yeah. How do I remember this non-separation aspect? The cultivation of beautiful qualities like compassion, like joy, gratitude, appreciation, um, patience, equanimity, a large view, a big view over time. These are all practices of, uh, these are all aspects of, of cultivation, all things that we're cultivating. And, you know, we, we cultivate these wholesome, skillful qualities anyway when we practice. You know, even if, you know, we're just, we think we're just paying attention to the breath yeah, and bringing back the wandering mind to the breath. What are we actually cultivating there? Patience. Yeah, certainly. Hopefully kindness. Yeah, not too much judgment. Yeah. 
generosity, yeah, of giving our attention to something, yeah, the capacity to, uh, you know, choose where we place attention and to to stay with that. It's a really skillful quality that we're cultivating. So we kind of cultivate these and as we do that and then we we can do that we do that anyway in practice but we can also do that intentionally yeah bring intention in say ah yeah i really don't want to practice today but i'm gonna do it you know because i want to cultivate patience and i want to cultivate determination and i want to cultivate equanimity yeah which can be there with whether i feel like doing something or not yeah bring that in you know, so we can kind of do that intentionally as we practice as we cultivate the beautiful wholesome skillful qualities you now we're changing our own mind you know, changing this mind rewiring it you know, that's the language of modern neuropsychology right we're rewiring the brain you know, so that it goes into those and this is what the buddha was talking about years ago it kind of, this is where it then tends to go into these ways of looking, ways of relating, rather than the default settings of the human mind, yeah, of greed, of hatred, yeah, of confusion and delusion. Now we can start to see this is quite a big thing to do <laughs> with the human life. Yeah. See that cultivation. And this is something we do on our meditation seat, yeah, but, yeah, way beyond that, yeah, way beyond the meditation seat, yeah, because if we just do it on the meditation seat, <laughs> what a waste of a human life, yeah, that's such a small amount of the time, yeah, and so what would happen, you know, oh, on my seat, I'm, cultivating non-judgment and patience but the rest of the time <laughs> and then you know coming back so much harder so we bring that into more and more of our lives more and more of our experience yeah and so um yeah, I want to give some examples of this because it's important to see how we bring this into more and more areas of our lives, but also how we bring this into um, also really situations of directly meeting the challenges that we're talking about. Yeah. Challenges of um, really unnecessary human caused suffering yeah, in the world. we're kind of rewiring the brain but then because of this non-separation we can take it into the world and create change there um, as well so i always find it really difficult to choose the example for this but i think i know what i'm going to go with today maybe i'll do two so the first one is a conversation with my brother uh, I had quite a long time ago, I don't know, about 10 years ago. Don't remember which one of the wars on Gaza that was when Israel was bombing uh, Gaza, but it was one of those wars. My brother lives in Jerusalem, he's a doctor. Um, and we were talking on the phone and he was just heartbroken and desperate. Yeah, I was here in England. and. You know, he was just saying, I just can't bear it. I just can't bear it. And I feel so helpless and so hopeless. This is happening in my name. Yeah. And I feel helpless to change it. And not only that, I feel very alone, yeah, which is another one of our experiences as people who care. Right? I feel very alone. He said, everywhere around me, which is what happens in Israel when there's that kind of situation, everybody's shifting to the right. Yeah, everyone's became, becoming more extreme in their views. And I feel so isolated yeah. and so alone. So of course, you know, we were talking about it. 
supporting him. And then I said to him, you know, you feel isolated, you feel alone, you feel helpless. Yeah. And I reminded him, you know, said to him, don't forget your children, father of three. Yeah. By staying clear to your integrity, by speaking up, yeah, about what you believe to be true, yeah, you are giving such a gift to your children, yeah, because they see something different to everything around them, and they see it in the person that uh, they love, yeah. And that inspires them. And so you're keeping that going. And this is something so important for us with cultivation. Yeah. Sometimes we think, ah, you know, this, I'm helpless. There's nothing I can do. Or what I can do is so little in the face of the suffering. Yeah. And yet we're keeping those qualities going in the world. We're keeping them nourished. Yeah, we're keeping them going. And others can see that, whether it's just in our household or further afield. Yeah. Other people can see that. So it has, it keeps rippling, never stays just here. It can't. Yeah. And so it doesn't mean that, you know, in this case, that we walk away and we feel that it's okay what's going on. And of course, not just in his name, the fact that he lives in Israel. Yeah, it's not just his name. Yeah, when war happens, it's in all of our names. Yeah. Doesn't mean that we say that's okay. It doesn't mean that we stop trying to do what we can to stop it. But we also see what we are doing. We also see the impact of the cultivation. Yeah, the big picture, big picture over time. And we can reflect yeah, on all the human beings yeah, in the past that have kept these qualities, these attitudes, these intentions alive. Yeah, and how they continue to inspire us, whether they're famous or they're people we've never heard of. Yeah? But they've done it. Yeah, they've done it. Yeah? They've stayed true yeah, to integrity. So this is one kind of example, you know, and I, I, I like sharing this story because I feel like it doesn't have a lot of glory in it. <laughs> it's very mundane. Yeah. It's very everyday, but it also touches on the core of our humanity yeah, and, and what we face. Yeah, and I kind of look at my, I said this quite a long time ago, my brother's kids are now between 15 and how old is the oldest one? 22. Yeah. And can see what they're doing with their lives. Yeah. So you can see that continuing to bear fruit. Yeah, continuing to bear fruit. So that's one example of the cultivation. I'm going to give another one. Um, because like I said, this is the heart. It's so important. Uh, this was um, it's a story I've told often in Dharma Talk. So I apologize if you've heard it before. Um, also quite some years ago when um, I went to pick up some Palestinian friends uh, with a nine-year-old daughter who was undergoing cancer treatments in Israel. <coughs> and I went to pick them up from the checkpoint because Palestinians cannot drive across a checkpoint between Palestine and Israel. They can only get to the checkpoint then they need to walk across and have transport on the other end, no public transportation. So yeah, what, what does one do? So I went to pick them up, uh, myself and my partner, in order to drive them to the hospital in Israel for her treatments. And um, some human rights organizations had arranged that they would cross the checkpoint not in a Palestinian checkpoint, but in a checkpoint for Israeli citizens, which means they didn't have to walk um, for you know, a really long time carrying the little girl 
through the Palestinian checkpoint, which is how it is. This is a checkpoint for cars. So one of their relatives could drive them right up to the gate and the gate needed to be opened. It was a particular gate. And then uh, we could wait on the other side with the car and you could just be taken from one car to the, to the other very short distance that had been arranged but I knew this was only the second or third time it was done I knew that uh, it doesn't always go smoothly yeah so we came early yeah so here's the story so we arrive at the checkpoint as a Sunday morning first day of the working week in Israel yeah Sunday morning um, I arrive we arrive half an hour early at the checkpoint to make sure everything's in place so that when they get there it's quick and smooth and I walk over, we park on the side, I walk over uh, to the soldiers that are at the checkpoint and it's eight o'clock in the morning. They're there because they've been there the whole weekend. They didn't go home for the weekend. I know that yeah, because I know the workings of Israeli society. Um, I walk over, it's two young women and I explain to them what I'm there for. And I ask them, uh, do you know it's happening? Is everything in place? And they say, nope, we don't know it's happening. <laughs> That's the sentence. Yeah. And what happens? Notice what happens in you now. You're noticing what's happening when I say that? And I just tell the story. What happens? What's your feeling? Don't, don't get dharmic. Just be honest. What do you feel when you hear that? Yeah. Do you feel the walls building up inside? And thinking, I don't like this person, yeah, or whatever it is, they don't care, yeah. So I can feel that, yeah, feel that. I look around me, this is a checkpoint, it's full of fences, it's full of walls, it's full of gates, yeah, it's full of separation, it's full of exactly the things in human nature which I have made it my life's mission to dismantle, yeah. And I can see what I'm seeing outside is happening in me right now. Yeah. The walls are building up. The barbed wire is being put, put up. Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. And I remember, here's the cultivation. Yeah. What is it that's important to me? What's meaningful? What is it that I want to do with this life right in this moment? Yeah. I don't want to build more walls. That's the phrase that came up in my mind when I asked myself that question. I do not want to build more walls. Okay. Yeah. So do you feel the empowerment? Then it's back in my hands because right now walls are being built. Yeah. So I can stop that. So body. Yeah. Breath. Compassion. Internal. Yeah. Forget about the other person. <laughs> Internal compassion yeah this is not a good way to be this is not a, a healthy yeah way to be yeah and so i breathe and i'm still we're still there all of this is happening very fast they're there i'm there yeah and i say to them look <laughs> yeah this is going on your commanders have been told you know we've spoken to them they're going to be here in half an hour. Yeah. What can we do? What can we do? Yeah, we're together in this. What can we do? Yeah. And so they said, okay, we'll go and check. And they went off very unenthusiastically <laughs> <laughs> to go and make the phone call. As they were doing that, and, they, and as they were doing that, they turned to me and they said, oh, and you can go and wait in your car if you want. And I said to them, no, this is important to me. I'm staying right here. Yeah. It's important to me. Staying right here. Yeah. At that point, a car of other soldiers arrived, a couple of more of them arrived, and they two two young men walked over uh, to see what was going on. Yeah. And you know. The, the, somehow the dynamic changed a little bit. They had fresh energy. It's interesting to see. Yeah. And so you could see, ah, it's changing. And one of them walked a, a, over to me and kind of joked and said, Oh, I've heard you're here to, um, I heard you, you're here to adopt a Palestinian child. Yeah. Joking. 
And I said to him, no, <laughs> I'm here to take a nine-year-old for chemotherapy treatments. Yeah. And again, you know, the walls going down, this time in him. Yeah. She can feel it. We're sensitive. We can feel it. And so it took, you know, quite some time <laughs> until, you know, I also made some phone calls. They made some phone calls. Eventually it was all set. Yeah. And so we were allowed to bring our car to be next to the gate where they were going to arrive. When the Palestinian car arrived on the other side of the gate, soldiers ran up to it to unlock the door, you know, to unlock the, the gate and open it. Yeah. When they saw the father carrying his little girl, who's now, I have to say, a 19-year-old medical student, healthy <laughs> and well, when they saw him carrying her over from one car to the other and gently putting her in, and then once she was settled, reach into his pocket to pull up his ID, which he has to show to them by, by law. They said, no, no, don't worry about it. Yeah. Go to, the, go to the hospital and we hope that she is healthy and well. Yeah. Small thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One situation. Yeah. 45 minutes in someone's lives. But we can see the power that our cultivation can have to change the world we live in. Yeah, these are 18, 19 year old soldiers brainwashed. Yeah, in a terrible situation. If we think about ourselves. Yeah, day in, day out in a checkpoint. Yeah, horrible situation to be in. Yeah, young. Yeah, and yet their humanity. Yeah. So just under the surface, yeah, don't need to look very far to find it. So these, this cultivation that we do in our practice on the seat, yeah, on the meditation seat and beyond it, yeah, when we smile at people, yeah, when we're on the street, when we pay attention to somebody who's offering us a service, yeah when we share what matters to us with others. Yeah. When we do that, the ripples continue and we don't know where they will reach. Yeah. We don't know. And we don't know what the impact will continue to be on other people. So that cultivation, yeah, so important. Yeah. Dharma practice as cultivation. Sorry, I'm realizing how long I've been speaking. <laughs> All right. If you need to stand up at any point, feel free to get the energies going. The third part of the model. Yeah. Dharma practices action. And again, it flows on from the cultivation. Yeah, the cultivation is not just internal. It's internal, but it gets um, energized, yeah, when we also bring it into action. And, you know, there's many... Um, things I can say about action. I'm going to say a few of them. One is I've spoken a lot of compassion about compassion today. The word for compassion, yeah, as a quality that we cultivate, karuna in Pali, yeah, same root as karma, yeah, meaning action, yeah. It's an active, yeah, it's an active quality. It's not just empathy, it includes empathy, but it's got that active movement to alleviate suffering, you know, to alleviate suffering. So it's an active quality. Compassionate action actually feels good. And I was encouraging us in the last meditation to feel the nourishment of compassion. Yeah? Hopefully we can feel it also when we're just kind of nourishing the quality in our meditation practice but certainly when we act in the world yeah it feels good yeah it feels good it takes us out of cycles of helplessness and despair yeah doing something yeah it can be a great antidote to frustration to depression uh, to overwhelm and to guilt yeah to do something 
I was remembering this morning, uh, also about 20 years ago, living on an ecological, what was called, calling itself uh, a green kibbutz in the south of Israel, an environmental kibbutz. And uh, my partner and I were there volunteering in the ecological projects, which are only a small part of the kibbutz. <laughs> and we were going bonkers with all the things that were not ecological. And we were finding ourselves getting really angry. <laughs> And then we thought, no, that's no good. We just need to do something about it. Yeah. So we got our, our watercolors and scrap paper and made a lot of different signs and kind of secretly put them up in different places. <laughs> and that made us feel very, very good. Um, so I'll just give you some examples, you know, things like um, in the laundry room. This was in the desert, serious desert, rains for maybe an hour a year. Yeah, serious, hardcore desert. Yeah. And yet there's a laundry room which has a tumble dryer. Yeah. And people go there with their washing. They put it in the washing machine. And then because as human beings, we're lazy and we don't want to carry the dirty washing 10 minutes back to our house to hang it up, put it in the tumble dryer. And so we put up big posters on the tumble dryer saying, you live in the most natural tumble dryer in the world. <laughs> very colorful, very beautiful. I have no idea who it impacted and how, but we did that same, you know, rubbish, the, the dumpsters near your house, yeah? But the recycling, again, by the dining room, 10 minutes walk, signs on the, on the, on the dustbins. <laughs> Please recycle, the planet needs this, yeah. And so we can think these are little things, they're small things, but the change internally, where we actually act, when we do something, when we give voice to the best of us, yeah, rather than getting frustrated and angry, yeah. So that's a really small example. Another example from, again, Palestine, the being peace retreats that we do uh, in Palestine, bringing Israelis over, and this is just... Uh, six months ago, someone saying, you know, this is the most sane I felt, an Israeli saying, this is the most sane I felt since I remember myself. Actually being here, meeting Palestinians, hearing from them about their lives, which is not easy, yeah? But moving into the situation rather than staying seemingly safe and removed, yeah? So our actions can take many, many forms, yeah? But, you know, really the seeing uh, it's our practice to act yeah it can take many many different forms you know you may join xr yeah huh? yeah or you may choose to you know sign petitions donate money yeah do something in your local environment yeah start an allotment you know there's many forms depending on the conditions that we have but it's actually our being yeah our heart and our mind need us to be to act for what we care about yeah otherwise there's that impact inside yeah yeah which is harmful uh, to us so our actions can take many forms and there's beauty in diversity yeah there's beauty in diversity but it's also vital that we do them <laughs> that we act on that, yeah, that heart's calling yeah, to alleviate the suffering in the world. It's part of our practice, part of who we are. And our choices, our actions, our words, yeah, impact our own experience, but also shape the world that we live in. Yeah, they shape the world that we live in. Yesterday, coming back to London, I'll just say this, I was just so happy kind of on the bus, <laughs> seeing all the corner shops, you know, that are still there. We've just been to, you know, Helsinki, which, you know, on the whole, I would say Scandinavians and Nords have got it much more right <laughs> about community, community living than we do in Britain. But on that part, yeah, searching really hard in Helsinki for independent stores to buy food in and finding it really hard to do, yeah, and having to go to supermarkets. Yeah, which is one of the things I don't do yeah, as part of my actions yeah, in the world. Yeah. Again, my way, not saying it needs to be yours. Yeah. And, you, ah, yeah. and why is that? Yeah, because enough people continue to buy in local stores yeah, and independent stores. That makes it possible. Yeah. 
So our actions matter, our choices matter. They create the societies and the world that we live in. So that's the, the three-part model yeah, where I've spoken for a long time, apologize. I told you once I start, it's difficult <laughs> to stop on these things, but remembering Dharma is refuge. Yeah, any time, yeah. Dharma as cultivation, yeah. practice as cultivation, and Dharma practice as action, yeah. letting it move through us into the world. And of course, we can see it's a model with three parts. They're not actually distinct from each other. Uh, any of the stories and examples I've given, we could actually see all three in them. But at different times, we can lean more into one or another. And that gives us um, just an incredible amount of um, um, freedom of movement, yeah, range of movement. Mm. 